Welcome to day 25 of your 30-day dental MBA. Put yourself in my shoes for a little bit. I wanted to break these up in hour segments for lunch segments, for um, a CD only holds 70 minutes information, cassettes. Um, we've been, this whole program, we've been bleeding over from the last day to the next day. Before I jump into uh, legal and ethical studies, um, which still is an operational logistics point of view anyway, they all merge. There's a, there's a reason for this flow, believe it or not. But let's continue where we dropped off yesterday. From an operational logistics point of view, I want you to build your plant to capacity to handle the flow, the waves. Waves are coming in. Apes come in in groups. Usually they walk in in little clans, okay? They don't come in like an assembly line. A bank has three uh, uh, drive throughs and 90% of the time it uses one or none. But on Friday when everybody gets their checks, they get all three fired up. Same thing in Barnes & Noble. This is where I hang out. This is my favorite little place. Uh, they got a children's area, your kids are back there reading, they got coffee, donuts. There's usually one person up here working. But if a wave walks in, they got operation logistics plant process where someone go to the speaker phone and say, I need all checkers to the front. I don't want hygienists standing up, walking around dental offices looking for the doctor. I'll see a doctor say, well, you know, I'm about ready to take an impression material. Where the hell my dental assistant go? And now he's up going one way, the assistant the other way. I mean, it's such a joke. You see doctors banging on bathroom doors. Is my dental assistant in there? And then they're going up front. They're going out back. Little they know she's out there in the parking lot having a cigarette. We sit there. We need operational logistics. We need every type of speaker communication. We need office-wide paging. We need computer terminals everywhere. Design your plant for the flow. Do not design your plant for the capacity. Uh, same thing in grocery stores. We talked about they have 10 checkout lanes, and they'll use one in the middle of the night. They use two during the day. They use five or six um, from five to seven uh, when mom gets off work and on Saturday. But for seven days a year, they have those extra, they have 10 checkout lanes because two or three are only used seven days a year, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Fourth of July, all the big holidays when everybody gets on, you know, Thanksgiving. Do you really carry every ingredient you need for Thanksgiving year-round? There are stuff that you only eat on Thanksgiving. Everybody gets up on Memorial Day and realizes they need barbecue potato chips, hot dogs, buns, pickle, relish, whatever it is. Everybody's down there. Camera crew's only looking for a case of beer. But uh, everybody has their needs. Same thing at McDonald's. McDonald's, this was designed by Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc is the one that said the service is different, designed for the flow. Here's McDonald's with one checker. Then now all of a sudden a wave comes in, she brings up grandpa. And then uh, five minutes later, we're back down to one and everybody's off doing something else. I go into dental office, I say, what is that lady doing in that back room? Oh, she just does insurance billing confirming. Well, great, well, what if four people walk in and four people call at the same time? Is an entrepreneur or someone who is always maximizing the return on their assets or capital or money? Is it really the best return on your investment to have someone back there doing um, billing or statements or confirming or whatever when there's three people standing at the counter that want to schedule for their next cleaning six months down the road or we're just told they need a filling and need a schedule for the filling and someone's on the phone? I want everybody on your payroll who's a receptionist up front. And then when, they, when, when, when you're checking out a patient, and the front's busy with a big wave of people, you're telling me your dental assistant in there five years can't do a financial arrangement for a broken tooth or a crown or schedule the next cleaning. Um, just build, put all your money so that you can handle the flow. For instance, here's a dental office. Here, here's a couple of things that um, <clears throat> Monus Rung Test Audits on tell me. Here is my dental office floor plan, okay? There's where my developer was. And you tell me why a hygienist in room two had to walk all the way. Um, stay on this slide here. Uh, will, you, will you flip over the slide? Okay, there's my hygienist in room two. There's where the developer was the x-ray. I never thought about it like that until I had my blueprints. And I'm sitting there, and you're counting the steps, and you're measuring the feet. Then she's got to walk back. And, of course, technically, the, the mathematical way to figure this out is you take a um, new Pythagorean theorem, um, um, base squared plus... The other side squared equals the square root of the hypothesis. So you figure out your uh, your deal. And you figure out that if you move the developer there, sure, you have to have a uh, plumber come out. Sure, this might be $1,000. Hell, we just put in a different, a whole other AT2000 machine. You put it there. Now, now she goes back. And you say, well, oh, Howard, well, from that, 
um, to the other one, uh, okay, well, she only saved one minute. That is, that is one item where she not only saves a minute, two to four hygienists at a time are each saving four minutes of cleaning, eight cleanings each a day. You find a hundred things like that in your business. Ray Kroc, would, Ray Kroc when, after um, the 10th McDonald's, the 11th one, he would, he would lay the pad. The architects would come out and they'd, they'd chalk out the whole um, blueprint like this. Then he get all the workers from the first 10 to stand there and say, what would you do differently? And they say, well, I'm bumping into here. Why do you need to walk over there? And, and every time we spill a Coke, it's leaving the Coke machine here and running into the French or I'm in here, yada, 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 yada. And from stores number 10 through 100, every single one, lay the slab, draw and chalk what we've got, get all the workers who are doing this operations and find out what's right. It took from 10 to 100 before he started building McDonald's straight up. So, you know, do your math, go back to the screen, do your math, find out what it is. Okay, Albert Einstein said the whole of science is nothing more than the refinement of everyday thinking. And that's all it is. As you learn, you refine concepts. And, um, you know, first, you know, a kid says uh, walk. And then he distinguishes the difference between walking and jogging, jogging and running, uh, falling. I mean, all it is a refinement of thinking through vocabulary words. Back to overhead. We were talking about that, um, you know, I've never seen the word overhead used correctly one time in the major dental journals. Everybody tries to control overhead by controlling their expenses. People, you have no control over your expenses. Um, of all the offices I've ever been in and I looked at expenses, I would say the average dentist gets a B plus in expenses. The average is a B plus. You're getting anywhere from an A to a B minus in expenses. Expenses have too much focus. Hell, you got a lockbox over the thermostat. You have one bathroom. Um, it's only 1,000 square feet, 1,200 square feet. This is controlled by supply and demand, Adam Smith, okay? You have no control of your tax rate. The government monopolizes that. Uh, FICA matching, workers' comp, it's all monopolized by the government. Your utility, there's another government monopoly. You have no control. All this stuff, wages. You can't cut your wages in your dental system from $10 an hour to $1 an hour, or she'll go across the street and get $10 an hour. Well, if you cut an expense, like you want, like your staff comes to you and asks you for a raise, you say no, and they go get across the street, then you realize that wasn't expense, that was supply and demand. You can't control supply and demand. All you can control is sales coming in the door in units or dollar, and how fast you can eat these sales. I want you to look at this line here. Look at sales as basically like a, um, look, look at it like uh, you're going on a hike. Okay, you're going on a hike, and let's say that um, we're going this way. Here's the fat dentist, okay? And I say half fat dentist because he's a constraint. Everybody's waiting on the dentist. They're waiting to get in for a toothache, the hygienist waiting for a hygiene check. Let, this is what inventory looks like. You go on a hike, you leave at eight o'clock in the morning, and your skinny little receptionist and your skinny assistant and your skinny hygienist get out along the trail, and by the end of the day, these three people get to the campfire, and you're two miles back. Well, the farther you guys are apart, the more inventory you have, because everybody's waiting on the dentist. He's a constraint, she's a constraint, okay? So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go into your business and identify the constraint. Everybody's waiting on Herbie. Well, if everybody's waiting on a Herbie, why is Herbie back in his office waiting on an operatory? If everybody's waiting on Herbie, why is, why is uh, the hygienist walking around circles looking for the dentist and he's up here? Everybody should walk in their business and say, okay, what is the bottleneck? What is the choke point? What is the constraint? It's a dentist. Then you move the dentist to the front of the line. Now we're going on a hike and we're going this way. Now we take off on this hike. It's 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And about a mile down the road, the assistants, you know, they're all piling up. As they're piling up on his back, your inventory gets tighter and tighter and tighter. You don't have all this spread out inventory waste. And everything's getting tighter. Then these three start thinking, how can we exploit the constraint? And they start thinking, they start thinking, well, why is hefty Herbie Howie the dentist? Why does he got a 60-pound backpack on? He's fat. He's slowing everybody down. These three get together and say, Herbie, we don't want you to carry a backpack. We'll carry it for you so you can go faster. About another mile down the road, uh, the assistants are th start thinking, um, why is Herbie smoking and we're not? Herbie, um, you really shouldn't smoke on a hike. They take away your backpack. They take away their cigarette. Uh, they decide later on that maybe you shouldn't wear army boots. Uh, maybe they should trade uh, his Nikes. They'll go barefoot. But all these people do is identify the constraint. Everybody's waiting on the dentist. So I got to ask you yourself, if everybody's waiting on the dentist, 
Why is the dentist waiting on an operatory? Exploit that constraint, add another operatory. If you sit there and say, well, if we put another operatory, we'll only use it one out of three days. Well, by the time you put in a $30,000 operatory and throw it away 20 years later, it only costs you a can of Coke an hour. You've got a can of Coke an hour. What you don't have is time. Another way to um, do the constraint says, well, since everybody's waiting on him, why are we sitting there and accepting this PPO? Uh, why, why are we, uh, to get you in here, why, why do we agree to cut our fees a third when the other two thirds are all waiting for him? And then maybe you'll drop your PPO. This, this is what I call, you have a grapevine. Okay, every business starts out with a seed, they sprout, and um, every millionaire, within two years of his business, they start trimming back leaves and growing grapes earnings, okay? I walk into most dental offices, 10, 20 years old, it's such a big mangy grapevine, no one can even find the grapes. But if you go to a vineyard out in California or here in Arizona, you'll see that all they do is they have two stems, they trim all the leaves back and all they grow is earnings and grapes, okay? So read the book, The Goal by uh, Goldrat, and you're gonna understand this. Um, op more operational logistics, go to the screen. Please. Um, same thing like Siamese twins, x-ray units, you know what I mean? Why have, why have to go to one room to get an x-ray unit when it can swing between two? But what if one hygienist is taking an FMX in one room and the other hygienist is going to have to wait 15 minutes taking an FMX in that room? Well, 15 minutes is so much time and so much money that right by our um, Pano South machine, I have an extra bite wing machine there. Because that bite wing, that extra extra machine was $3,500 when I bought it. And I figured if I only use it to take an FMX one time a month, what's an FMX? $90? Um, it's going to pay for itself. Uh, view boxes, everything's operating logistics. If the patient has to get out of the chair and in order to see the x-rays go into the consultation room, redesign your deal to where you got cords, you got logistics. If sometimes you want the view box here, sometimes you want it here, get two damn view boxes. View, view boxes are not your cost. Waiting on Dr. Numbnuts is your cost, okay? Same thing with the... Um, Central sterilization. Uh, sometimes when they're waiting for an autoclave and it's got like a minute to run its cycle, they can just shut the chart down, enter something in the computer. Computers are not my cost. Equipment on the aggregate costs dentists somewhere between 3% a month, okay? 3% of your cost is equipment. And 10% is front office labor, 20% is back office labor. You got 20% just of your cost, just in front office and back office labor. And equipment's 3%, so what do you do? You start coming back with these cockamamie ideas where you're gonna have an intro camera, but you're just gonna have one, you're gonna wheel it from room to one. So you don't have 3% to put an intro camera in every room, but you've got 20% to wheel it around all day long. You've got 20% payroll, and you always got your money for payroll on the 1st and 15th, but you don't have 3% to put a terminal, computer terminal in every operatory, break room, central sterilization, bathroom, uh, you name it. Fortify your high cost service labor with technology. Um, you know, these developers, uh, put them anywhere. I mean, um, if you're always having people wait on developer, gosh, an AT2000, go to the slide, please. Um, an AT2000 developers, I don't know what it is, 3000, 4000, I don't even care. All I know is this I've gone into office after office after office where the whole afternoon, no one took a $90 FMX on three patients, so he lost out $280 because the x-ray machine was broke down. And then I come back when it's working again, and I got people waiting to get in to develop x-rays. This, this machine, if you have a machine, like a developer or a compressor or a pump, where if it shuts down, no go, then you need two. You have to identify all your constraints. You don't have any control over a snowstorm. You know, when you wake up and you're a uh, uh, 90s, 99, uh, um, you know, there's a big blizzard up north and a lot of dentists I talked to in Columbus and Baltimore lost anywhere from a week of two weeks to work. Okay? You don't have any control over that. That's when you just throw in the towel, put a log in the fireplace and uh, do what you want to do every morning for the last 20 years uh, for two weeks. But you sit there, you don't have control over snowstorms, hurricanes, civil wars, lightning, but you've got control of your business constraint, especially when the design, everything is the design process. Get a floor of your blueprints and um, common causes are problems from your methods, materials, machines, personnel, environment that constitute the process. Common causes are expensive to eliminate, for example. Uh, examples of common causes are human variation in customers, 
Uh, some customers are always there five minutes for their appointment. Some always run 20 minutes late. Staff behavior. Uh, some receptions like to get drunk till three o'clock in the morning and then uh, waltz in late. Um, you got slight variations in treatment rooms. Eliminate that. I want every treatment room to be like Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines only flies one plane, a 737 300 or 737 Boeing. Everyone can fly it. Every flight attendant knows where the peanuts are. If the pilot calls in sick, every pilot can fly it. Every maintenance man can fix it. They got spare parts everywhere. In fact, Herb Keller are such a genius. He has a spare 737 at every one of his major hubs of Phoenix and uh, Dallas. He says, it, he tells his gosh darn maintenance people, if you wouldn't put yourself in that plane, park it, I'll have another $50 million plane here in an hour because you know how much money it costs when a plane full of people goes down? Hell, U.S. Air lost one every year for five years in a row. They're trying to fix 727, 737, 747, 757, McDonnell Douglas, Airbus, all the commuter planes made from Brasilia and, and Saab, and, and it's, a, it's too expensive to have variations in your treatment room. Every room's the same. Uh, and that's another thing with suppliers laboratories. I can't afford to have my labor, 10% dental assistants. I can't afford to have them dealing with five or 10 suppliers. Not only when you deal with five or 10 different suppliers, you're nobody's best person. It'd be like, well, I don't have a wife. I have five girlfriends that each date me once every uh, five days. You're, you're nobody's, you're nobody's VIP. Give all your business of supplies to one person, and then you're going to be very important to that supplier, and you can start leveraging that supply relationship into a value chain. Same thing with labs. Don't send your credit bridge to five different labs where no one really cares. I send all my stuff to one person. My lab bill is about $18,000 a month, and when we got something special going on where we got a really disastrous case, I just say, hey, value chain, hey, supplier, you like that $18,000 a month. I'm really, really sorry, but here's my deal. I just prepped this lady's teeth and she's flying out of town in two days and they're no problem, Howard. It's a value chain. We communicate. And things with your suppliers from operating logistics point of view. If you're dealing with a lab man or a lab woman, every time you get a crown case, okay, well, could you imagine if you went and uh, painted a painting with your eyes closed and you painted a painting for three, four hours, no one ever let you saw it? That's what your lab man is when you don't have a feedback. I mean, every one of those feedback, everything is a system. Everything is operation logistics. You got to check out, was, how are the contacts? How is the occlusion? I mean, if you have to adjust slightly on every contact, if every time the current bridge man says, oh, yeah, I remember that case. I worked a whole day on that case, and damn, he had to adjust the contacts. They were too tight. Well, after 100 times in a row, they say the contacts are too tight. Guess what any animal can do? Adjust his behavior based on the feedback. Biology is nothing more than a feedback mechanisms and that the whole is greater than sum of its parts, as opposed to physics, which is just chaos theory, okay? So basically, we need value chains with suppliers and labs. And every time your supplier comes in, when he comes in, does he know what your last month closed out of? Does he know your goal? I mean, he comes in every Monday or this or that. But when he comes in, do you sort of say, oh, by the way, uh, last month our lab bill was 12000 and our supplies last month were 9%. You know, our goal is uh, 7.5. I just want you to know that, um, you know, I just ran this report. I don't know if Dr. seen or not, because, see, I'm in charge of this. This is my job description. But I know when he sees it, he's going to be disappointed. And the lab, and, and when the supplier sees this, and then the next month he comes in, well, you know, our lab supplies 9%, our goal 7.5%. I don't know if Dr. seen it yet. I'm in charge of this, but I know he's going to be disappointed. Well, this person's got plenty of time to work with you on a value chain, as opposed to just sitting out and having all these uh, bidding out gauze and peanuts and bleach and all this stuff, where you're taking your labor and you're having your labor work on this, whereas as part of your value chain, your value chain's working on this with their own labor. And now your dental assistant's assisting, and you have a lab person that's thinking, how can I get our lab supplies down to 7.5%? What are they doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And then finally they can say, well, finally they'll work out a common um, um, plan. I'll say, Doc, you can't have it both ways. You can't say you want your supplies 7.5%, but on every gosh darn material you use, you always pick the most expensive. Now, I've got a way to get this down to 7.5%, so you make a choice. If we switch from this impression material to that, this needle to that, this gauze to that, da 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 I'll have you at 6%. 
So come on, let's all communicate. Let's have a relationship. There's no relationship when you don't communicate. Communication is a two-way street. Giving some guy an order is not communication. Accepting a crown from a lab man who doesn't see it and has no feedback on if it fit, for all the lab man knows, you looked at that crown one time, flush it down the toilet. And when you quit using a specialist, an endodontist, an oral surgeon, whatever, and because you're upset with all these things, and you didn't give this person the feedback, Whatever upset you, if you really cared about earthlings, this person is going to keep doing it to all the other patients for 20, 30 years. Work with your suppliers and incorporate them to the value chain. Okay, this is all done by design, flow, treatment rooms, accessibility, availability. Um, Mark Twain said that common sense is not so common. Common sense is always covered up with common practice. Just because it's common doesn't mean it's common sense. Why are there 200 billionaires in the United States? Because they had more common sense and less math than the rest of the village. If all you do is listen to everyone around you, you're never going to be smarter than anyone you know. Special causes are problems that are not part of the process design. Special causes are transient, fleeting events that affect local areas of the process for a short period of time. Examples of special causes um, are um, staff calls in sick, Dental treatment room breaks down, x-ray developer goes down, lab cases aren't delivered in time, temporary help to cover vacation maternity leave, untrained temporary workers. Special causes are operators' problems, okay? They're 15 to 20% of the variation. They're assignable causes, they have local faults, faults, they're sporadic problems, they're operator problems. The other 80 to 85% are management, they're design flaws. Uh, their chance causes, systems faults, chronic problems, like, like it was a design that you always had to walk 20 feet to the developer instead of two feet. It was a, it was a design that every time the hygienist wanted to go tell the doctor she's ready for an exam, she had to get up and walk across the room, where at the grocery store in Barnes and Noble, they just go to a PA, I need all checkers to the front, all checkers to the front. So design this thing. It's a design process that they knew when you use the drive through you wouldn't fill up the parking lot, you wouldn't even turn off your car, they get your car in there and out of there, okay? Everything is a, is 80 to 85% are common causes, and you have design, you have control, maybe it's time for your office to remodel, maybe it's time to realize that most millionaires made their money in real estate, and you're going to be in this game for 10, 20 years, and maybe you can go uh, leave your office and drive to the first grocery store you see, and as soon as you take three turns out of your office to the drain, you're on a four-lane road, you're headed to the grocery store, and right there in the corner is a 2,500-square-foot state farm building or a 2,500-square-foot uh, um, little office deal right by a parking lot or cross street from McDonald's, right next to an Arby's, and you sit there and say, you know, we're in 1,200 I'm renting like a landless peasant, and maybe I could go get there and go from 1,200 feet to this 2,500-square-foot building and design this thing from a process layout that will always have capacity. We'll always have an extra chair for an emergencies where we can catch the fish, not cook, clean, eat it, and we'll have we'll finally have the process we need. And come on, um, Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut has a 2,800 square foot building, and they sell pizza for 395. And you, in your mind, believe that you can't have a dental office that's over a thousand square feet, and you're doing more money than a gosh darn Pizza Hut. You're especially doing more net than a Pizza Hut. So why is it that um, Long John Silver's and and Wendy's and all these places there uh, do far less than I do? They do half of what I do, but we're in the building the same size. It's all a mind block. If you're owning your own home. And your own home is twice as big as your renting office. You are middle class. And what's, and what's even worse than that middle class is you're teaching your gosh darn children to be middle class, okay? So the Industrial Revolution was about massification and low diversity scales of economy. Low diversity means massification, everything was the same. We built a lot of wealth from that because the Industrial Revolution, we had apes go from making stuff to machines making stuff. We started to make things consistent. We started to create standards. The Industrial Revolution started about 1440 with the um, basically the, the printing press. It lasted 500 years, and it, and it basically it basically added in real dollars. It took the wealth of a person up about um, about 500 fold. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, a hundred fold. Uh, the Knowledge Revolution took off about um, probably about 1985 with the rise and fall of uh, Microsoft and Intel and Dell computers and Hewlett Packard. The knowledge revolu revolution is about customization. It's highly diversified. It's targeting niche mar markets. It's about going from mass to class. It's about going from massification to customization. And uh, the principles for constructing a flow chart is your staff 
you have to lay out who owns this problem. I can't have the hygienist saying, well, the assistant did this and the front did that and yada, 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 yada. When we go to job descriptions, I know what names on there because people come and go. I want you to design your job description for a dental office in Johannesburg, South Africa, 3,000 years from now. And you're dead. The patients are dead. For all you know, the United States is gone. Al Gore ruined it to the ground. And you sit there and you get a job description. You are a forward. You are a guard. You are a center. You are a hygienist. You're, a dental ass- you're the head dental assistant. You're dental assistant number two. You are the recall coordinator. You're the office manager. You're a dentist. You're dentist number two. Yada, 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 yada. Define ownership. Establish boundaries. And make the boundaries physical. This is the insurance coordinator's desk. This is her desk. It is not your desk. Define the process. Draw it out on a flow chart. When you check out a patient, draw it out. I mean, you don't draw it out for all you know, a thousand years now, someone will take the the patient out the back door, walk her all the way around the earth and come back in the front door. Never leave anything to chance. That's what Ray Kroc said all the time. And hell, he was dealing with 16-year-old high school, drove out, dope smoking, tattooed, pregnant welfare Democrats. He had to define everything down to the step. Establish control points. Implement measurements. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. W. Edwards Deming, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, statistical genius that rebuilt Japan single-handedly said, if it's not measured, you can't manage. Hell, you wouldn't have any feedback. You wouldn't even know what happened. And take corrective action. Make action, okay? Make a decision, meaning to cut off from what you used to do, and now we've decisively cut off from what we used to do. We're taking action. Thoughts precede actions. Do action every day for 90 days. You got a habit. Collect all of your habits up. You have your character. Your character will define your destiny. You can't mess any one of those steps. If the goal is to make money, then an action that moves us toward making money is productive. Any action that takes away from making money is non-productive. Read the goal. And if you're and if you got a bunch of staff say, well, we're not about money, say, great, I'm not paying you on the first and fifteenth. I had no idea you're a candy striper. Hell I'm gonna get you a new uniform, make you look like a candy cane. If your staff's if your staff's not into productivity, efficiency, if they're not into driving down costs and raising up collections, if they think that money is a four-letter word, if they think profit's a four-letter word, please stick an ice pick in their head, because if you fire them, they're just gonna go pollute and ruin some other dental office across the street. We need financial measurements for two different reasons. One is control, knowing to what extent a company is achieving its goal of making money. The other reason is probably even more important. Measurements should induce the parts to do what's good for the organization as a whole. So we first need a strategic business mission plan. What are we about? What is your goal? What are we trying to do? Today's dental. Um, what is our goal? You know, providing optimum oral health care to the whole family. You know, what, what is your mission statement? Step one, identify the bottlenecks. What is, what are people waiting for? Are, are people waiting, um, are, are people calling and the lines ringing three times? Do we need another line? Do we need another receptionist? Don't look at his respe- receptionist as expense. Look at the receptionist as someone who takes orders and takes money. You go to McDonald's and take your order. That's the receptionist. What's the second thing your receptionist does at McDonald's? They take your money. Then thirdly, lastly, they give you the, the hamburger. What do they got at McDonald's? They got, they got five people at the counter taking orders and taking money. They got two people hanging out the side of the building taking orders and taking money. So they have seven people taking orders and taking money. And they got two cooks in the back on crack making the hamburger. They staff seven people taking orders, seven people taking money, and two people making burgers and fries. You've got... Four people back there. You got a dentist, two assistants, and a hygienist. You got four people back there making hamburgers, and one lady up here taking orders and taking money. And then, so what happens? And you got four people making burgers. You always make the burgers faster than she can take orders and take money for. Then I walk in there. What happens? You're up there with no patient saying, Well, what are you doing up here? Sitting on your hands? What are you up here? Smoking pot? What the hell's going on? And then I look at the counter receivables, and then you freak out, and you're like, Well, why aren't you collecting the money? Well, it's a systems design. When you have four people filling hamburgers and one person taking orders, taking money, you'll fill the orders before you take all the orders and take all the money. And in fact, have you ever gone into a, um, a dental assistant's mind about 10 minutes before close? It's about like 4.50 and uh, you, get off, you get off at 5. The dental assistant is usually sitting on a chair thinking, tonight, I wonder if I'll drive straight home or stop at the store and pick up a few items. Then you go to the hygienist's mind. She's back there thinking, uh, tonight... I wonder if I'll have fish or chicken. You go into the receptionist's mind. She's up there thinking, tonight, 
I wonder if it'll be scotch or vodka, okay? And then the assistant's like, um, oh, I think I'm going to set out the tray so my room will be all ready to go. And then you go up to the hygiene, she's like, if I pin the napkin chain to the chair and put out my fluoride cup, I'll be all ready to go. The receptionist up there with a stack of crap, a stack of insurance, a stack of billing. She just shoves it in the drawer and says, the hell with it. It's happy hour. She's out of there, okay? Identify the system's bottlenecks. Decide how to exploit the bottlenecks. Don't have doctor waiting on a chair. When the hygienists say, well, we need an hour to do a cleaning, say, well, if I shave one minute off the developer, if I shave one minute off here, one minute off here, if I shave 10 minutes off, how much time would you need for a cleaning? If she still says an hour, she doesn't get it. I mean, hygienists are, are uh, very, very religiously dogmatic. For instance, they say, well, I need an hour for a cleaning. And I, I'm just, I'm standing firm. I say, okay, so let me get this right. Lady comes in with an upper denture, a lower partial. She has two freaking teeth. How much time do you need for a cleaning? An hour? What, 30 minutes of tooth? What are you, blind in one eye and can't see out the other? The hell are you on? Well, well, in that case, I'd only need uh, uh, 59 minutes. Look, if they're irrational, it's probably because your incentive's all screwed up. You're paying them hourly. Hell, I'd rather get paid the same to do two teeth and a denture is the same as having a cancellation, no show, or having a full set. I mean, if it's all the same, I get $20 an hour no matter what. Why the hell should I care? You start paying these people incentives. You start paying high just 33% of production or, or less. Or It's actually what the market rate is. Uh, if you're in some towns, depends on how many hygienists are. If I can find someone that'll do it for 1%, get that person. If you're in some big cities where you have to pay uh, 40%, it's supply and demand. But the deal is this. Hourly says, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm just doing time. I don't give a rat's rear. The incentive system's all screwed up. And when they come in and I say, well, I'm offering you a commission, they say no. That's because they're looking at me and they say, I'd rather bet on him. I bet he can always make payroll in the first 15. I ain't betting on me. I'm not, I'm not into it. I'm into myself. No community involvement. I wouldn't help you fluoridate. I wouldn't go into schools. I wouldn't get involved. I wouldn't go to continue ed. I am an absolute deadbeat. In fact, I have a picture of Al Gore above my bed. And if that's their mind, get them out of there. But when someone comes in and says, oh, really, I get some aid production? So if I get faster and more efficient, and I do this and I do that, oh, my God, I'm going to get into it. This is my room. I'm going to build up this entrepreneurship within your entrepreneurship. Subordinate out everything else to the above decision. Elevate the system's bottleneck. And, um, it, you know, just keep going. Just keep going through this process over and over and over. So now we're back to the front. We have a system. We set them down. Do not have people walk in. If you talk to any Navy admiral, They'll tell you that, sure, 71% of the earth is covered by water, but in Navy warfare, it breaks out into a chess game, okay? Well, they know there's 21 choke points in the Navy, and the United States Navy is ready to shut it down. They know that no matter what you're doing, you got to go through the Suez Canal, Strait of Gibraltar, Panama Canal, tip of South Africa, tip of Argentina, Straits of Magellan, yada, 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 yada. They know where the game's played, and they're ready. If given the war, boom! All ocean travel stops by controlling the choke points. You know your patients come in that door. They don't drop in from the ceiling or dig up from the bottom ground. You know where these people are coming in. Identify your choke points. Look at your floor plan. What is the strategic process design? Where are we going to implement measurements on what management information system, what measurements, what are we going to track, what are we going to measure, what are we going to load into Excel spreadsheets. And if your receptionist has been there working 10 years on a computer and she can't do Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel, then go, go in the yellow page, look up your computer. There's computer training. There's all kinds of little tapes. they got an hour-long tape called uh, you know, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Microsoft Word, and Excel is the best. It's, a, it's brainless to use. You absolutely don't need a brain to learn Excel, get an hour-long tape, but that's where you start tracking a lot of your measurements since Soft Dent, Dentrix, and Eagle Soft um, are basically just glorified insurance and billing machines. You know, you can start uh, um, tracking uh, exit interviews, um, um, time uh, on the phone necessary to make an appointment, um, how long it takes to come in to get a routine cleaning, a uh, routine scheduled dentist appointment, an emergency dental appointment. If you track it, it'll get better. In fact, most consultants say, just by the process of tracking, just on the basic mammal, just by giving in biology, just basic people, the average practice will improve every single category that wasn't tracked before and is now just physically tracked, monitored, and posted. Just give your existing crew feedback. Every measurement can usually improve between 5 to 10% a year by not even having a plan. 
I mean, just by walking in there, if, if someone like me takes over your office and we say, okay, there'll be no coaching, there'll be no training, there'll be no nothing, but what I will do is here's the measurements and we're going to start measuring these things and I'm just going to give you your own feedback because I'm a conservative. I have faith on you on the family farm. I don't believe that Moscow should tell you what to plant, when to plant, when to harvest, all that stuff because that's, that's the decision maker is too far away from the environment where the information is coming in. As you move the decision maker, Away from the environment where the information is coming in, the decisions on the aggregate get lower and lower quality. See, Russia said, since the communists are the only ones that went to college, we will have to tell the peasant farmer what to plant, when to harvest, what to do, because he's an idiot peasant and we're smart communists uh, who went to college. We'll see the decision makers far away from the environment where the data is coming in. So on the aggregate, with or without college, he makes stupid decisions. America is reversed. We said, we don't care that the damn peasant farmer didn't go to college, can't read or write, and he married his sister. All we know is since he lives on the farm, he's in the environment where the data's coming in. And if a human being is in the environment where the data's coming in, on the aggregate, that person will make the highest quality decisions. So just by measuring stuff and posting and saying, these are the things our office measures, and I measure front office on these five things and assistance on these five things, yada, 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 and they see their measurements, they will improve 5 to 10% a year just because they're getting feedback, okay? When there's no measurements, there's no management. On-time performance and seating each dental patient is crucial. So there's your staff. And you're sitting there thinking, what the hell does that have to do with legal and ethical studies? Well, it's the same thing. It's operational logistics. We start with the chart. You know, um, what things do you, you know, it's an operational point of view. There's about a 10-point checklist we're going to blow through that if you do these 10 things on every appointment, when something goes wrong, you end up in the state board or you end up in a lawsuit, your lawyer is going to say, well, let me tell you something, buddy. Thank God you did these things. And let's blow through them. First of all, on law. John Fitzgerald Kennedy said, certain other societies may respect the rule of force. We respect the rule of law. If you don't like the law, then change it. That's what my mom always told me and my dad a thousand times. I don't care what you like or don't like. This is the United States of America. We don't like it, get involved, change. Just like I will not drop out of the ADA. No matter how pathetic I think its leadership is, they got a kick butt library, they got kick butt research, they got a brand name. Um, everybody in the media, the law of the land, everybody knows the American Dental Association, the seal of approval, all that kind of stuff. So I'm sticking with it through and thin. The 18th and 21st Amendment. Look, in 1919, the Constitution's 18th Amendment was adopted, prohibiting the manufacturing sell of alcohol. By 1933, the 21st Amendment um, repealed the 18th Amendment, ending the prohibition. We got two amendments. The guys are on 18th and 21st. They're useless. One says you can't have a beer. The other one says, okay, we changed our mind. You can. Hopefully, by 2000-something, we'll do this by drugs, and, and we won't have to uh, uh, ruin all of our uh, neighborhoods again. But that's the point. If you don't like the law, change it. And it's okay to try something, but God, if the war on drugs hasn't done one damn thing in 25 years, except for one, and that is the price of every drug in America is now selling at 10% of what it was costing in 1980, and that's after you spend a billion dollars a year and have 400,000 people in jail. Definitions of law is this. First, law means a system that promotes social order and justice by establishing rules of moral conduct. Secondly, law means a principle represented by a rule. Now, common law is a body of law developed from both customs, cultures, judicial decisions that is in the form of cases. It started in England, our mother country, the first country to illegalize slavery, and it came to America, the second only country of 224 that illegalized slavery in 1862. This is how we move forward with law and order based on in God we trust, what is right, putting human dignity at the forefront. Now probate, just blown over some terms so you can follow the conversation, Probate is the legal process of settling a person's estate by collecting property owned by the deceased, also called the descendant, paying his or her debts, and transferring ownership of the descendant's property to his or her heirs. It really disturbs me that I run into dentists all the time that have been out of school. They've only been out of school two or three years, but they're already married. They already got a kid. They don't have a gosh darn probate. They don't have an estate. Uh, they don't have an, any uh, life insurance. Uh, don't tell me you love your kid and you love your wife when you're running naked with uh, $80,000 of student loan debt. you got no life insurance. Uh, you don't have any uh, probate written out. You don't have a lawyer. Or go to AFCO. Alan F. Thornbrecht's AFCO is in all 50 states. He has done over a billion dollars where you can go into a relationship and just sit there and say, well, I just want you to know me so that in case of death, 
instead of just having a life insurance policy, you've already got my office financial statistic. They'll come back maybe every year or two, update it, whatever, whatever. But in case of death, if they're on file, all your wife has to do is say, oh, by the way, my husband's in a head-on car wreck last night. He's dead. AFCO can come in there and get rid of this practice in no time at all. And within six or eight weeks, Alan told me that you've lost at least half the value of your practice and not having a long-term relationship. And I don't want you to do it with a dental broker. They're too small. I want it to be with a national broker so that if Alan died or your AFCO broker died, it doesn't matter. AFCO is going to go on 100 years after Alan's dead in Atlanta. Okay, so get life insurance. Get an estate, get a trust, get a relationship with someone who can liquefy this stuff. There's a lot of dentists out there. I've seen them. I, and the reason I'm onto this hard is when you're a practice management person, you got big brand name recognition, you get some wild, wild calls. I've had about four suicide calls in the last uh, seven, eight years, and I've had about 20 bawling wives who, I mean, I couldn't even understand what they're saying. Husband died fishing, scuba diving whatever the hell it is, no one thinks anyone 30 or 40 is going to die. They die, uh, they die all day long. I mean, guys, there's 161,000 dentists out there. One or 2% of them are going to drop dead this year, okay? Now, dot your I's and cross your T's. Historically, if the lawyer used the wrong procedural writ, the person would lose the case. The only appeal was to the king. The effect still lingers in the conscious society. We have all heard, for example, that you must cross every T and dot every I. That's from the word writ. And you must cross every T, dot every I of the writ when dealing with legal matters. Even thought today, um, it is more literally true. I mean, you go in there in the chart and you say, why well, did this or this or this? And then the king says, but you didn't enter it. And if you don't dot the I and cross T of the writ, it doesn't matter. Ethics and morals. Ethics is from a Greek word, ethos, and morals is from the Latin word, moralis, or basically really the um, same thing, even though there's an attachment to ethics is more done by logic, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Morality is done more by religion from Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Hindu, who, um, whatever. Socrates was 469 B.C. He believed that wrong actions arose from ignorance. I believe that Socrates the most. I don't believe, I, I think what you truly believe is evil is usually pathology, and what's really believed as unethical is just dumb, ignorant peasants making low-quality decisions. He believed that the way to discover universal rules was to use inductive reasoning. Through the questioning process, people would progress from general to more specific knowledge, as Albert Einstein said, and eventually discover universal rules that apply to all examples. The Socratic method is named after him to this day. Now, if you want to remember, it's Socrates, Plato, or Aristotle. Just think of Spartan. You know, Spartans in Athens. Well, Spartans, SPA, that's how I memorized it in college. Um, SPA, so Plato's next, 428 BC. Plato, also in ancient Greek, was a student and friend of Socrates. Plato believed that all people desire happiness. Since people try to act in ways that produce happiness, actions contrary to this objective are mistakes caused by ignorance. According to Plato, if people know what moral virtues will lead to happiness, they will act virtuously. Okay, if you're miserable and you're stressed out, and, I, and so many of these consulting deals were so stressful, like a doctor want to talk to me in a break, and he's telling me what's going on, and his wife like starts to correct him, and he just, you just see him, you know the tension, he's like, excuse me, do you mind if I just, da, 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 da. and I'm like, hey, wait, hey, settle down, I'm nuts. What, what did you just say? Well, he says, yeah, and then it's like, excuse me, what are you going to say? Da, da. It's so much stress, I'm like, I mean, the number one cause of divorce is over money. Number two, sexual dysfunction, whatever. I mean, come on. Kids are living in split up homes because you can't even put your gosh darn home on. Go I I'll go into homes uh, and, and uh, talk to divorced people and they'll sit there and say, these people live together 10 years. They couldn't even, they, each person, I said, okay, you write down what percent you spend on uh, house, clothing, eating out, entertainment, clothes, long distance, whatever. And this, uh, that, these people aren't even within 10%. It is absolutely chaos theory. Uh, so if moral, if, if these actions will lead to happiness, implement practice management. Come on, go back and get your MBA. Get Mike, get on, get gosh darn Eagle Soft uh, for your home stuff and your dental stuff. Take control, be a CEO. Quit dumping everything on your office manager, your poor gosh darn wife, and then, and then causing all these problems just because you won't get your shit together. Aristotle was 384 BC. Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher, was Plato's student. Aristotle regarded ethics as the study of practical knowledge. He believed that people's goal was happiness, and they achieved it when they fulfilled a function. Life is work, is work a job, or is it a vocation, okay? 
they had to discover what function made them happy. Moral virtue fell between extremes. For example, generosity fell between stinginess and wastefulness, and courage fell between the extremes of cowardness and foolishness, okay? So he had a line continuum, and he thought, um, he thought these things would make you happy, and I, I believe these Greeks, uh, well, they're the cradle of Western Civ. Um, and then there's uh, some of these, I'll butcher the names, um, and, and how do you pronounce this? Antisthenes, 444 BC, founded by uh, whatever, Antisthenes in ancient Greece. These were the cynics. The cynics claim, when someone says you're cynical, this came from 440 BC Greeks. Cynics claim that people achieved happiness by leading a life of self-control and being free from material desires and pleasures. He believed that individuals he reasoned that individuals could not control these appetites for very long. So a cynic thinks that you're basically uh, a hedonist. Um, Epicurus is uh, actually the one that I think Tony Robbins uh, must really read a lot because if you follow Tony Robbins, uh, it's a ton of Epicurus, 3041 BC. Um, Epicureans equated happiness with seeking moderate pleasure and avoiding pain. Pleasure was gained through prudence, moderation, courage, justice, and friendships. You still hear to this day that the number one thing apes do is they avoid pain and they seek pleasure. This goes all the way back to Epicurus. Now, Zeno was 336. These were the Stoics. Stoicism was founded by Zeno, who was from Sidium, a city located on Cyprus. The Stoics thought it was foolish to try to shape circumstances to human desires. That's you dogmatically force-feeding the market. A divine intelligence guides and governs circumstances, directs all things ultimately towards goodness. Kant was, uh, then there was a big gap, and then we, you know, we went into, uh, who knows what happened, but basically intellectuals stopped from uh, about 200 BC to about 1700 AD. We come out of the Dark Ages, and first guy on the scene was Kant. Immanuel Kant, who was from uh, Prussia, based his philosophy and reason. He believed that a universal set of ethics principles existed that could serve as action-guiding rules. The reasoning process, this absolute and finite set of rules, could be determined. His rules were duty-based. For example, he believed that truth-telling was a universal rule. If lying were to become the universal rule, everyone lies, life would be impossible because no one could trust anyone. If truth-telling is a universal rule, everyone's moral duty is to tell the truth. Kant's logic um, was more like absolutism. Then came Rawls, 1921. John Rawls was a professor of philosophy at Harvard University. He contends that because society is not heterogeneous, people hold opposing and sometimes and oftentimes irreconcilable views. Thus, democracy requires tolerance, which leads to the principles of extensive individual liberty. This is where Barry Goldwater ruled, and everybody's screwing up today. I mean, you got, if every single group wants to get together and take away the personal liberties of a small minority group. Well, if every group gets together and steals someone else's um, little um, liberties on their little deal that they can't handle, like, um, um, like uh, Ted Kennedy, he can get drunk every night on gin and tonics, and that's okay, but if you smoke pot, you go to jail. Um, the uh, gosh darn uh, um, religious right says, well, you can't um, abort an unborn fetus, but if a baby's born and no one wants it, and you got... About what, what do you got, almost a million kids in foster care? They're like, well, you know, I'm too busy. Uh, I don't want to deal with a foster kid, an unwanted child, who's shipped around from seven or eight households before they're 12, but I don't want you onboarding an unborn fetus. See, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I think the pro-right movement ought to be, if these people don't want uh, any unborn child to be uh, aborted, I think that, and the Democrats say that um, um, you should have abortion, I think it should go open all the way up and say, okay, uh, if abortion's legal, then we should be able to abort anyone. Okay, uh, uh, hey, you, over here. Until 21, I have the right to abort you. If abortion's legal, I say legalize it for any age, any person. But what you have to do is you have to require tolerance. You can't sit here and say, I will drink gin and tonic and you'll go to jail for smoking pot. Um, I will stick my genitalia in this hole, but you can't stick in that hole. Um, if everybody would just mind their own freaking business, and this is John Rawls' genius, and this is what democracy requires. It requires tolerance, okay? And that's especially with the ADA. And, um, you know, you got this little inner band, inner elitist, 65 year old, good old boy, white head, liver spot, telling all these young dentists what they have to have shoved down their throat with no democracy. Those people won't even allow me. Do you know that? I have spoken 500 times in 35 countries, most of the state dental societies, and the ADA doesn't have enough balls to let me speak. The CDA, there's California, 
you know, home of San Francisco. They can't even tolerate me to speak there on the Hinman meeting. The three biggest wusses are the only place that I haven't spoke. I spoke everywhere else around the world, and these three wusses can't even, t can't even handle, can't even tolerate um, me to have the individual liberty and freedom to tell you my view. I mean, I can't believe that totalitarianism exists in medical and the ADA, the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association. The only people today that go before Congress who's, um, who actually extend personal liberties to their members is the uh, Teamsters. Teamsters have two million members. Every Teamster gets to vote for the president Teamsters. But, you know, the NRA, they say guns should be legal. They, yeah, they think guns should be legal, but they don't even think it should be legal for their 20 million members to vote to who heads the NRA? If the 20 million members of the NRA could vote for the leader of the NRA, you wouldn't have a complete idiot saying that it's legal for a kid to carry a submachine gun into a university school just so you can go dove hunting. See, we need tolerance. And the bottom line of philosophy, is this reasonable? And we have irreconcilable views. I'm a Hindu, you're a Buddhist. I'm Jewish, you're Islamic. Yeah, I'm Christian, you're Catholic, you're Baptist, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to agree on everything. But let's agree to tolerate diversity and go in your house, shut the door, and mind your own damn business. The Exxon Valdez perspective. According to the National Academy of Sciences, Washington, D.C., the world's waters are polluted annually with 540 million gallons of oil, the equivalent of 50 Exxon Valdez accidents every year. Now, this is, this is natural oil. 540 million gallons of natural oil ooze out of the Earth's crust into the ocean. But what, that's 50 Exxon Valdez accidents a year. But when, but when man does it, it's wrong. When the Earth naturally does it, it's fine. I mean, I mean we, we all have artificial yardsticks. You know, if we spill uh, an Exxon Valdez and a man did it, that's bad. We're going to spank him. But if the Earth does it, it's natural. Same thing with carcinogens. The top 10 carcinogens known to man. Hell, the number one's on peanut dust. Hell, you get this one side of toxin from peanut dust, it'll shut down your liver and kill it within the day. The top 10 cancerous things we know go naturally on fruits and vegetables. But then man puts a little herbicide to kill a grasshopper and you go ballistic because it's man-made. These are what we call irrational artificial yardsticks, where your measurements aren't based on anything because the yardstick is, is formed out of thin air. Stakeholders. Stakeholders include whenever you make a decision, Remember that the absolute truth is objective, is absolute, it can't be done um, without regard to perspective. When you make a decision, is this the shareholder, the owner's um, opinion? Is it the government's opinion? Is it the employee's opinion? Is it the customer's opinion? Is it the player's perspective? Is it the community? So see, the people who are billionaires can stand in the middle like a wheel and realize, I'm going to make a move. And the owner, the shareholder is going to think something, a different perspective than the government, than the employees, than the customers, than the suppliers, during the public. You have to balance between six. The dumbest decisions I be seeing made all day long is when dentists say things, and as they're babbling out, they, they're not thinking what the government would think about this, what their, their own employees would think, what their own patients would think, what the suppliers would think, what the city would think. Try to balance the six perspectives. Jurisdiction. Juris means law. Diction means to speak. That's the power to speak the law is the literal meaning of the term jurisdiction. Divorce is not like it seems on TV. Only 8% of the couples were both represented by attorneys and more than 60% of couples have no attorneys in divorce actions. So remember, you're, when you are not familiar with a, with, a, with a subject, like say oil in the ocean, you see this Exxon Valdez, you believe it. You don't know that 540 million gallons of oil ooze up out of the Earth's crust. Uh, when you see t the media, they always tell you about this big settlement. Oh, McDonald's is sued for a zillion dollars because some lady poured a hot coffee in her crotch. To sue is one thing. To win is another. To collect is a third. You really think she collected that? Don't be an idiot. The media hypes everything. Okay? The Supreme overload. Thousands of cases are filed each year at the Supreme Court but it decides to take an average of only 100 to 200 cases. So when you hear some babbling dentist say, I don't care if I have to take it to the Supreme Court, you can't even get in the damn Supreme Court. They're not going to listen to your babbling ape cases, okay? They take 100 to 200 out of thousands and thousands and thousands. 95% of cases settle out of court. And it's always worried they're going to be in front of a jury of 12. It'll, it never gets, less than 5% get that far.
Although many lawsuits are filed, about 95% of these are settled out of court, mainly because of the time and expense of trying a case. Furthermore, of those cases that do finally reach trial, about 97% of those are resolved at the trial court level. Relatively few trial court decisions are appealed and even fewer change on appeal. The media makes think, well, it don't matter. If I lose, I'll just appeal. Though they got to hear your appeal. They don't hear your appeals. Uh, hardly ever, unless they think there's some, you know, some real big thing at stake. The civil law system is based on statutes that can be traced back to the Roman Emperor Justinian, 1 AD. Suing is one thing, winning is another, and collecting is a third. Every time you see a big number in the law, in the newspapers, it's because they, they're suing for this amount of money, or a jury of 12 peasants um, awarded this money, but collecting is a third. Usually the judge um, um, throws it out, or he'll say, well, instead of 20 million, we'll go 1 million or a half million or 300,000. Or the, maybe the appeal will say, we're going to hear this appeal because we're not going to let this guy win $20 million for whatever. Suing is one, winning is another, collecting is third. What is printed in the paper is a fourth. What is ethical is a fifth. If you can't argue the facts, argue the law. If you can't argue the law, argue the messenger. I love it in national journals. Every time someone beats the hell out of me, in fact, I've been beat the hell out of my three articles a month for the last three months in one magazine alone, Dentistry Day, and I love it. Because every time I get the crap beat out of me in the National Journals, I send out so many press packages for speaking at 6,500 a day, all expenses, and then go there and have a blast. So remember, if, um, if you hate me, please send a letter to everyone you know, because every time they get the letter, they go, hmm, I wonder what, what he's saying to get you riled up. I think I better listen to this guy. Every time, I mean, look at John McEnroe. You could even name any of the tennis players before him who, who iceberg board. Then McEnroe throws a damn rack and says, the hell with you, man, you are an idiot. Next thing you know, he's doing $10 million commercials. Same thing with Muhammad Ali. No one wants boxing. It was a crude, rude sport. Then Muhammad Ali starts saying, man, I'm the greatest. And other people start saying, oh, he's an egomaniac. And then what did he start prize fighting for? $50 million to fight? So if you think I'm a communist, gay, homosexual, drug addict, my kid's divorced for my wife's a whore, please tell everyone you know. Um, and then if, when I spit out an editorial, if the only thing you can come back with is, well, Fran's an asshole and he's an egomaniac. And, uh, I mean, if you can't argue the facts, at least argue the law, the principle. And if you can't argue the law, uh, then you're just shooting at me. So every time the ADA responds to everything I say with, with well, we won't let them speak of the ADA or the CD or the Hinman. Well, then if the only thing you do is take a shot at the messenger, obviously my facts are congruent. Obviously what I say is obvious. You just can't handle the obvious. Because if there was something with what I was saying, you would focus in on the particulars. The Hippocratic Oath, I thought I'd read this to you because everybody in the world thinks all the doctors took the Hippocratic Oath, okay? I've never met a doctor, physician, cardiovascular surgeon, oncologist. I've never met anyone who even knows what the Hippocratic Oath is. But since everybody thinks you take it, I thought for the first time in your life, I'll read it to you. I swear by Apollo physician, uh, yada, 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 yada. Uh, that I will fulfill according to my ability and judgment of this oath and covenant. I will apply dietic measures. I will ne never give a deadly drug. I will not use a knife. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, then there's the oath of Geneva. The Gettysburg Address probably has more relevance to a dentist than the, uh, um, than the gosh darn Hippocratic Oath. But anyway, um, dentists benefit from practicing in a field less prone to disastrous results. Why do people not sue dentists all the time? So, okay, I got this woman in here. I did a root canal. We end up losing the two. She's whining. She would sue me for $20 million because we had to pull her molar. So now we go to court. Here comes a jury of 12 people. Uh, I got six ladies up there with a the denture. I got four ladies with a partial. And I got one guy with two teeth wearing a flipper. And they're all watching this woman whine about this, uh, gosh, her loss of a tooth. And the back row of the jury saying, well, honey, Bonnie, you should just pull all your teeth and get a denture. I mean, you're, I mean, if you want to go to court and you want to win some money, show me someone dead, show me someone that got maimed. Don't go up to a jury of a bunch of partials and dentures and tell me that your tooth broke or you lost a tooth. Now, disciplinary actions against dentists um, vary all over the place. Get Jeffrey J. Tonner, J.D.'s book, What They Don't Teach in Dental School, about dental malpractice. I mean, you got states like... Um, like gosh darn uh, Texas, who have 50 um, disciplinary actions a year. Then you got Arizona, which is a uh, third the size, gets 96. So it depends on what state, what kind of kangaroo court they're running in your backyard. Call the American Associ Association of Dental Examiners. Uh, the American Association of Dental Examiners can tell you what's going on in your backyard, what you need to watch for at 312-440-7464. 
It's 312-440-7464. That's the American Association of Dental Examiners. The profile of a typical person that's going to sue you, 89% of the plaintiffs are women. Okay, the average dental practice proportion is 60% female and 40% male. Um, 66% of all root plant keratitis and gum surgery is done in women. Uh, women are more into girdles, makeup, plucking their eyebrows, lipstick, bouffants, hairs. I have three pairs of shoes. I swear, this is not a joke. My wife has 300 pairs of shoes, okay? They are into this. When they lose a tooth, they are very, very hacked off. They're 91% are over 55 years old. This woman is bitter. You talk about the angry white male. This is the angry white female, okay? Her husband just left her for the receptionist. She just had a hysterectomy, and she raised three kids in a control freak fashion. They all flew the nest and told her she was an idiot. And now you, you broke her tooth. The whole freaking world's coming down on you, buddy. That's why you got to carry insurance. Um, that's why you should be incorporated. Often, they're often employed in a health-related field because they know just enough to be dangerous. Alexander Pope's observation, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Usually she's, uh, well, I'm a receptionist in a hospital. Woo, man, you know just enough to be a vegetable. Uh, well, I'm a registered nurse, doctor. Like, oh, you must be kicked around a lot by your physicians. But these people are in health-related fields. They're over 55. They're usually divorced, post-hysterectomy, estrogen, whatever. And I know that all the women are going to beat me up for this, but Betty, these are facts. If you want to write me a hateful letter, first explain why 89% of them are women, explain why 90% of them are over 55, and explain why the 30 tournament variables are in a health-related field. And then after you read that, you'll probably learn a lot about yourself. Um, involves a spouse or friend. When you walk into an operatory and you're going to do a root canal on this, usually it's a, it's a gosh darn passive pathetic male and his wife sitting there at his foot looking at you and she's like a nurse and she's over 55. She's looking for a fight. Send those to your worst specials, okay? Whenever you walk in a room and there's a woman over 55 and you'll ask the man a question. Well, sir, how long has this tooth been bothering? Oh, it's, it's been bothering two weeks. Uh, excuse me, psycho, um, I was asking your husband, uh, can you go uh, put yourself in a meat grinder? In fact, why don't you go to the store and rent that movie uh, Fargo? Yeah, at the end of Fargo, uh, this guy takes his wife and throws her in a wood tree pulper, okay? Why don't you go sit in a mulcher while I talk to your poor husband? And uh, then I'll say, sir, forget the tooth. Just go get a divorce here. Let me put you on some nitrous. Uh, let me talk about the uh, women at this bar I know. Um, involves a spouse or a friend. Um, who usually brings them with them because this is what happens in codependent. Okay, I'm your, I'm your spouse. I make you miserable, but we're not going to focus on our dysfunctional relationship. We're going to pick an external enemy and we're going to go beat up on a dentist. It's the same thing like the Shah of Iran. Don't worry about runaway inflation. Everybody's on dirt floors, no running water. Let's have a war with Iraq. That's right. That's right. Someone external is bad. Every time you see a codependent relationship, these two couple, everything's dysfunctional. They either focus on a dog or focus on a child or beat someone else up out of the family. They never want to just sit down and say, why are we both psychotic? Uh, dental charting. Your chart is the single best weapon against a malpractice claim. If it's not in the chart, it didn't happen, okay? Write up your charts. No jargon, please, okay? The Ten Commandments of Dental Charting are this. Never, ever, ever alter or amend a chart. When they subpoena a chart, let me tell you something, buddy. You only have malpractice insurance for malpractice, okay? You do not have insurance against punitive damages. If the, if the judge says you pay her $50,000 because the root canal had to be pulled and you used surgery or whatever, and you're going to pay $100,000 in punitive damages because you tried to alter the chart, well, your malpractice doesn't cover punitive damage. I've seen dentists... Get in a lawsuit. The dental malpractice people covered, uh, you know, $100,000 for this. But they lost a million dollars because they tried to alter the chart. Altering a chart, and then when you're trying to defend about, I'm a good guy and I try to do the right thing, and the jury's saying, yeah, then why did, you, why did you add that in? When you go back to a chart, you know, a year later and try to add something in, it takes a forensic scientist about eight seconds to prove that. White out, you know, you scrape it out. People, let me tell you, when they find a dead body decomposed, they're going to find out who killed her. You're going to alter the chart a year later? You don't think they already know what's going on? Don't be stupid. Never, ever alter a chart. It's punitive damages. The jury, you look like a criminal liar felon, and the judge is going to penalize you and your malpractice is going to cover it. Um, chart patient compliments using quotation marks. If you put in a currency that says, oh, I love it, put that in there with quotation marks because then the jury says, well, 
He put it in quotes. You said that at the time. And then she's up there saying, I never said that. And they're like, ma'am, it's in quotation marks. Chart patient noncompliance. How you when they come in, they say, well, you know, I know I never floss. Right in there. Quote it. I know I never floss. That way, five years later, they got gum disease. You, you know, chart noncompliance. You know, you want to build this chart so this patient looks like what he is. Expend, spend an extra five minutes charting bad or unanticipated results. When you walk out of the room and say, damn, I screwed that up. I can't believe I broke that file. I can't believe I uh, did this. I can't believe I did that. If you ever feel guilty, dirty, or bad, or just feel like, yeah, damn it, that's not what I intended to happen, sit down on those cases. If you're ever going to have a bomb go off into that, spend an extra five minutes writing what happened. Make chart entries consistent with the appointment book. If you say, uh, this page came in on 1-15-2000, and when it goes to court, the schedule says it came in 1-14-2000, the whole jury is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, either you digitally enter that, that deal and that's wrong, and that's why we need oper that's why we need scheduling on computer, that's why we need terminals in the operatory, Use dental lab personnel for difficult crowning bridge. You got a big gosh darn crowning bridge case going on. You got, you got some case that's going to require five or ten implants going on. Use a gosh darn lab that only does implants and crowning bridge. And if you're not sure what's going on, get the guy out there. Make it a team approach. Follow up telephone calls for difficult or invasive procedures. When you pull someone's wisdom teeth, when you do a root canal, I do it for anybody who gets shot. I don't care if it's a filling. We call them that night. The assistants call them a week later. Chart alternative recommendations and treatment plans. Um, when you sit there doing a denture, right in there, you, you know, um, went over implants, didn't want that, went over kind of didn't want that, went over parasurgery, didn't want that. I'm um, review charting from assistants and hygienists, update medical status for each visit. The single most common cause of punitive damage in dental malpractice case is altering the chart. In some states, punitive damage by law cannot even be covered by insurance. Don't change the chart, okay? Um, chart patient compliments always use quotation marks. Um, he neglected Howard to inform the patient of the possibility of surgical repair, improper technique, failure to refer to a specialist, failure to explain all the available remedies. Always write that stuff. George All Orwell observed the past belongs to those who control the present. When you're in court, your chart, you're controlling the present, the past is water under the bridge. We always write ADAR, ADRA, advantages, disadvantages, risks, and alternatives. Every gosh darn time, um, we're going to do a root canal. Um, ADRA, informed consent legally requires that the patient understands advantages, disadvantages, risks, and alternatives. So when you're in court, that, what, what's ADRA? Well, we explained all the advantages, disadvantages, risks, and alternatives of doing um, this root canal on the crown. Now they say, well, you wrote that in there, what did you talk about? Now you can talk about everything, and they know you did because it says ADRA. Uh, Mark Twain astutely observed, nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits. Um, Chart patient noncompliance. They refuse to see a specialist. Uh, they refuse to follow the recommendation. Always start the chart with NCMH. No change in health history. Now we're in the chart. They say, why did you give her this vague constrictor? Why is she pregnant because you gave her this antibiotic? Well, look at the chart entry. She came in January 15th at 1 o'clock. First thing, no change in medical history. NCMH. And then ADRH, advantages, disadvantages, blah, 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 blah. Um, and you have an upset patient, redo the work, pay another dentist to redo the work, or refund the damn money. There's more dentists sitting in court because tight ass wouldn't give them $500 back for a denture that didn't fit. Either redo it, pay for another dentist to redo it, let them choose it in the glass half full, you choose the glass half empty, they ain't your buddy, golfing buddy. Redo the work, pay another dentist to redo it, refund the money, stay out of court, it's more productive staying in your dental office, having a great $10,000 day than sitting there in your state board. Thanks for another fun day.